Thank you for joining us on Something to Talk About. Lots to talk about today. We've got a conversation with the organizer of a grassroots organization. We've been having a conversation a lot about medical marijuana on Guam, whether it's going to happen in the next few years. They've put together kind of a plan. They have an idea who on Guam needs to use medical marijuana and the conditions under which they're going to have to get it. We're going to be talking to Andrea Pelicani coming up here on Something to Talk About. And thank you for joining us. Andrea Pelicani, as promised, I am delivering. Uh, honestly, uh, good, how are you? Good, good thank to see you. you. Good to see you. Hey, we've got some food for you. King's Restaurant, hooking it up again. We've got uh, some fresh fruit, of course. Uh, this is the Chesa Plata. This is a Tanana Cutney and, of course, the Chamorro Mozzarella sticks. <laughs> I can't wait to pour the Finadeni all over it. Oh, I know. It. I know. It's so good. Even the Tatizas are so good. But thank you for coming. And I wanted to, I wanted to talk to you because the... Medical marijuana thing is a really hot issue, or or not. I don't know. You know, it, it seems like there's a lot been a bit of a delay in the rules and regulations. Tell first of all, tell everybody the name of the organization that you kind of represent. Well, we are from Grassroots Guam, and um, our mission is to uh, promote responsible use of medical marijuana and safe access for patients. Okay. And, and that's all part of what the entire plan for medical marijuana. That's exactly the mission, right? Right. And so, you know, everything should be patient-driven because without the patients, no businesses will survive. The program yeah. is just not going to survive. So we're about creating balance, and we want to promote balance in the industry with big businesses, small businesses, uh, patients, caregivers, all of the above, couriers, bakers, chocolatiers, whatever you ha you name it. Um, we want everybody to contribute to the industry. Now, how did this all start, though? I mean, what were you, you know, what was happening at the table that you were sitting where somebody said, oh, I know how we could do this. I, I know how we can get involved. What was that about? Well, um, you know, we, we know a lot of people, and I have friends and family in the States that are in the industry, um, and they, we've all been aware that this was coming around, so we decided to do some research to figure out how um, viable, you know, uh, would we be able to uh, participate in the program as well. Yeah. So I mean, by getting in on the ground floor, it made a big, it makes a big difference because now you, you are like one of the people who are in the door at, the, at first. Does not matter? You know, you know what I mean? There are a lot of people who want to break into the industry. They just don't know how to do it. And they know that it's going to be a profitable industry. By getting in on the ground as quickly as you guys have, you, you must have needed to assemble pretty fast. Well, we've been actually working on this for a year. Um, you know, um, we're, our, our network is in the States, and so we're in places that it's legal to do testing and, you know, come up with formulas for, for oils and tinctures and whatnot. So all that's already happening. Um, but getting in on the ground floor, yeah, it's pretty important because we, we are hoping to put our stamp um, on the program and to, to be able to influence our regulators and legislators to um, put a really good, uh, thriving program together. So tell me, you know, they had the first hearing on this where you guys showed up at the legislature and there was a lot of gasping over what these rules said to govern the industry. And right. out of the gate, it sounded out of, uh, it, it was expensive, <laughs> it, it, you know, right. out of reach for a lot of people. Right, it's, it's the proposed draft uh, was cost prohibitive, right? So, um, you know, you once again, we're, we're about uh, safe access for patients. Now, patients are finding that it's too expensive, that deletes the, de mm. you know, it kind of deletes the whole access portion. Uh, because it's too expensive. It's no longer accessible for them. So they'll turn to the black market. Um, and that's, that's what we're trying to make sure doesn't happen. Well, in reality, I mean, the market is still here. I mean, no one's right. not going to say that there isn't a free-flowing marijuana industry right now that is thriving. And that's the point that, one of the points that we've been trying to make. We can't pretend that the industry doesn't exist. It's just not regulated. It's not regulated, but, and, and well, here, here's the thing. I had a conversation with you on the radio shortly after you came back, or on your, I think you were leaving that hearing. And a guy calls me up, and, and there's like a, 
a sort of hui of maybe three or four uh, distributors or farmers, a group of people uh, who have identified themselves as a, a consistent provider of you know marijuana for recreational use here. And they're opting not to become involved in the program because th they know that they don't want to be regulated for one and so they'll continue to provide it but he said their big deal is is the pricing they can't they can't raise their prices and then price everybody out of the market uh, because then there's too much competition and right. so they're going to remain sort of steady at where they are at this level yes. so you have two industries going on at the same time both with the same purpose but one of them is just strictly sort of recreational and selling it on a, a you know whatever the street price is. Right, but patients will turn <coughs> turn that way if 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 it's too expensive <coughs> on exactly. the regulated market, and that's <coughs> we're we're trying to um, you know public health they're they're doing an amazing job. I mean this is no small feat, and um, but they're coming at it from a regulatory aspect. Yeah. Um, is you know, this the, is this a regula a regulatory issue? It is. It's, uh, it's only about it's only the regular it's only a regulation issue. For yeah, you guys. Okay. It, it's a regulatory issue. Um, you know, they had stakeholders meetings. I wasn't aware of those stakeholder me meetings. Patients are the the main stakeholders in this program. Um, I asked a question at UOG at the UOG forum, and 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 the question was. Who is representing the patients on this advisory board, or who is representing the patients? And um, Mr. Gillen's response is, "We have to be careful with that." But why? Why is that? Um, well, patients get emotional, right? They get mm -hmm. emotional. They have health conditions. They have cancer patients, um, uh, family members that are ill, dying uh, um, under hospice, ambulatory, and so they can be. But there are groups that uh, promote uh, patient advocacy, um, like us, uh, like mm -hmm. us, you know. But what, what is the issue about patients identify, being identified? What is, what's the worry about that? Well, what do you <laughs> Is there a worry about patients being identified? I mean, are, are you coming across a situation where people who would take advantage of medical marijuana are choosing not to be known or remaining anonymous for now? Is um, there a stigma or anything? associated with that? Well, yeah. I think uh, uh, that's another thing that our group is trying to do is kind of change the stigma. Um, you know, if you go and visit our page, it's a lot about uh, education and uh, outreach and, and, and to change um, the view of who your cannabis user is. Um, you know, on the recreational market or, or, or all our lives, you know, we've had a certain idea, idea or stereotype of, of mm -hmm. what your cannabis user is. but. Uh, it, that's really a very small part of the, the, the segment of users. Yeah. Um, the average woman on a medical program um, is about, you know, 40, 42, 43 years old. I mean, that's not your standard... Uh, Marijuana user. Right. Yeah, yeah. right. Are you, have, you, um, have you guys put together a, 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 like a plan of how this is all going to happen once it does happen, once the industry is sort of introduced and the players are all in line. Are you planning on in some form to open up a shop or a bakery or a something? Is that we, ultimately? We hope to ultimately. I mean, uh, and it would depend on the, the final regulations um, as far as you know, how they're going to allocate licenses, uh, registration certificates, and the cost. But all of that's already in there. I mean, you already know this because it's sort of based on the Arizona rules and regulations. So all of that's mapped out. Uh, Distribution not, and who not can purchase. Entirely. And uh, not entirely because, uh, you know, Arizona is a much bigger market. So if we're playing cut and paste. Mm -hmm. uh, on a patient base of 3,000 at the moment. No, I meant like there are there are rules already in place that govern the method by which a person can purchase it or how it can be distributed. I mean, it's already in in the rules and regulations. That's all part of the program already, right? Right, but there's a lot of other details like uh, what is considered organically grown. Um, is that going to be you know, addressed um, by, the, you know, is it FDA organic or what, what are, what are the, um, you know, qualifications for that? Uh, what type of pesticides are acceptable? What type of extractions are acceptable? Uh, butane can be dangerous. Um, mm. Is butane extraction going to be okay? There's a lot of little details that need to be clarified uh, before you even finalize your business plan. I really feel like uh, for a lot of people, 
who grew up in the 70s. I'm like getting another crash course on 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 the use of marijuana. It's it, very it, sophisticated. Yeah. It is. I mean, it, it never was in the 70s is what I'm saying. Right. So it, because it was usually used for 60s and 70s for recreational purposes. Like, hey, what's the problem? Why did join and feel better? But there's so much more that's going into what's happening. That There's, there's a lot of muck. That is now they're talking about a, a delay in 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 being able to activate that first you know store or that first uh, you know paths for people to to start using it. Right. And, um, you know, this was a people's initiative, and um, one of our concerns was, um, you know, if I'm not mistaken, uh, Mr. Gillen on the on Ray's show uh, stated that the AG said the legislature can amend. Uh, can amend it. Mm -hmm. um, that that concerns me a little bit. It's AAA process. I right. mean, that's where it's, it's got to be vetted. Listen, we'll talk about that because you. I want to see where you think that the legislature might have a problem. You must have an idea about where that is. Uh, we're talking to Andrea Pelicani, and we're talking marijuana and mm -hmm. <laughs> rules and regulations. We'll be right back. for joining us on something to talk about our guest Andrea Pelicani. You know, you are, the thing is about you which is really interesting is that you've been sort of in a public eye but not in a public eye because you've been doing a lot of things but you've always sort of been in the background where you're not but this is a forefront issue. Of all the times to come out, you're coming out on an issue that is a really big public. I mean, you get a lot of public exposure. Right. Um, you know, my father passed away from cancer. And so this is a personal issue for me. Um, I think it's a personal issue for a lot of people. If I'd have known then what I know now, you know, um, I wish I would could your have been dad, more did, Would your dad have smoked a um, joint or something? You no, know, he wasn't too old fashioned. So I think yeah, I, I wonder. A, maybe big, eat a cookie cookie or something. Or, you know, I, I wonder too. My mother also passed away and it, of cancer. And, and in the end days, the end weeks, it was very difficult to watch somebody deteriorate in front of your eyes and the pain that they endure uh, by the time we took her to the hospital several days before they died she died i think the doctor said i can't you're not taking anything how are you enduring this but you know chamorro woman martyrdom right. you know how chamorro women they so and 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 when this subject i wanted at the time to to introduce the possibility to her, but I, I thought that she might have been too conservative, so I never really introduced the possibility of doing something like that. But I think that now, like you said, if I know Stigma. now what, yeah, if I know now, uh, then what I know now, then I, I probably would have pushed it. You know, here's a brownie, here's a cookie, here's a something. <laughs> just probably just pushed it without her knowing. That would have right. been hilarious. But, uh, but so it's a personal issue for you. That's the and it's a personal issue for your family. Was this a whole family venture? Well, no, not really. It's just as as I started to learn more about it, I wish I could have done more to to help my dad be happier and com more comfortable. More comfortable. Yeah. But do you think? Okay, let's talk about that stigma for a second before we talk about what the possible legislative damage would be to the rules and regs. Do you think that there are people of our parents' age group that are currently using? I, I, you know, they I, are. yeah, they are. They are. There are people with um, arthritis, um, you know, cancer patients, uh, epilepsy. Uh, there are people out there, um, you know, they, and they are starting to now find out who we are and starting to contact us saying, mm -hmm. my condition is not in the program. How can I get my condition on the program? Um, and that type of thing. So that's the type of outreach that we're doing. But if the condition isn't on the program, you would st they, they're still going to get it either way. They're going to get it, which yeah. is why we want to try to figure out a way to do it. it right. right. Do it right. So what's the worry about the legislature getting their hands on it? Well, um, it's just a principle of the matter. I think the people voted on this. And I, I'm not sure what the point is. Because, oh, I see what you're saying. The people voted on it when they wouldn't take it up when it was before them. Right. They sort of tossed it off as a referendum. And so what does your opinion matter now? Did I just say it for you? Well, yeah, in, in, yeah. A, in a sort of way. But the people did vote on this. And, and um, if they're going to amend anything, uh, the people should know about it, have a say. I mean, they voted for this. So 
Um, there are things that can be improved on the original bill. Um, there needs to be some sort of allocation for lab diagnostic licenses or um, processor licenses. And so when they drafted the regulations, um, they made it clear that they couldn't allot any processor licenses because the law restricted them from doing so. So those are improvements that can be made um, and we think they should be made, but because the people voted on it, uh, I think it's yeah. just more of a principle issue. Um, you think that they should just enact the rules and regulations, give it a chance to play it itself out, and then find out, uh, look f if there are other problems that surface from that, that you just in a kind of fell swoop am make amendments to it? Do you want to just see them deal do it now? I I'd like to see the program launched properly and, and whatever process that's going to be. What about time? Because if they're talking about delays as long as two years, did I hear that right? I, I think two years is a little excessive. I mean, I think people would be okay with a few months if it meant uh, launching the program properly, you know, uh, making sure that everything's in place as opposed to rushing it. I don't think anyone's going to have a problem. Well, that's the interesting too, thing, too, because in two years, this administration will change. And people like Jim Gillen... Uh, from public health will not, will, are likely not to be there. I mean, right. I'm going to assume that he won't got be. Arizona has that problem right now. Arizona has that problem right now, the, the public health. Switching horses in midstream, right. yeah. And so they've got issues with their, their programming, their software, which is the code that we're trying to take as well. And so, um, you know, that's just a whole other issue. Yeah, too. that's a whole, yeah. So, so what are you going to be doing in between now and then? I mean, what what do you do when you're kind of at this in this place? Well, we're trying to grow our outreach. Um, we want to hear from the community. Um, and, and that's been a difficult thing because a lot of people are a little nervous to talk about it. Um, they're, they're a little nervous to come out in front of it. I mean, there are people out there, doctors, lawyers, who kind of want to ask questions or find out more, but they just don't really want to come out in public and do so. What, what is, what, why? What, what's the scare of it? Well, you know, with lawyers in particular, they can't, they can't really talk about it. I mean, they run the risk of being disbarred. I mean, it's really conspiracy. Oh, because, to yeah, it's, a it's crime. right, sure. Um, and so that's one issue. And then doctors are, are you know, it's a licensing issue, really. Um, can they get involved? Should they get involved? We want them to participate in the program. And we have access to um, phys physician training for any doctors who want to participate in this program. Um, but that, again, is dependent on regulatory. So they're just going to wait to see what the rules and regs and, and then fish it out from there. What about people? Uh, these are people that are patients, like the actual patient. You are, is there an outreach for them as well? Have you been trying to? How do you do that? Hey, calling all pot users right now. Right. Step well, up. and we, we try to post, uh, you know, articles about different medical conditions, lupus, cancer, um, you know, PTSD, and, and, and we notice that people come in and respond to those either through private messaging or commenting on, you know, commenting on that. But the public hearings were great. Um, on the third day, it wasn't televised, and so we noticed a lot more patients and caregivers came in. Oh, that's a good that point. Day. Yeah. yeah, that's a good point. So, so the, you you have uh, patients that are sort of still in hiding and wanting to remain anonymous. You're trying to push something for them, I, and I know what this right. is like. You're trying to push something for them, yet they don't want to come forward. So you have to be sort of a voice, right. Without a whole lot of backup, right? Yeah, well, I know what that's like. Yeah. yeah. So, so how long can you last? How long? You know, where does that, where is that going to take you? How long do you last? Well, we we hope that when the program launches, we, we would like to put in an application for something. Mm -hmm. um, once again, that would depend on what the final regulations and the costs uh, you know, come down to. If we can build a business model that we think that will be sustainable, um, I mean, that's our ultimate goal. If not, um, we may continue to just do patient outreach and, and try to get involved with groups. Um, we hope to some day soon talk to Guam Cancer Care, and and, and it's difficult because they're they they receive federal funding. These types of groups receive federal funding, and so they're concerned that their funding would be at risk. And it's just all this catch twenty. Do you think stuff. that the, there? Do you think that that there can be built an underground industry, adopting some of these rules and regulations, some of the things that would fit into the personality of of the goal? 
And, and I mean, and I would assume that there is a bit of that going on now. There's an underground industry already. Yes. And these are, I mean, and a it, little bit more sophisticated. And it's an on the up and up. These are like people, we're not talking about people using recreational. That's a whole nother industry. But there is already, don't you think, a medical marijuana underground industry? There is. Yeah. There is. Um, once again, we, we promote safe access. And right now their access is not safe. Um, they, they need to be sure that what they're taking doesn't have pesticides, especially if they're smoking it. Um, you know, that's once you have the combustion, chemical change happens, and we don't know what happens to pesticides. Um, but these are people, again, people who have contacted me. My yeah. family member but, has but, epilepsy. But these, but, these, but these growers know this, though. These growers know how they can do this organically. Right. And they, and they can already be... be providing the crop. Right. And, you know, going back to one of the points I made at the hearing, you know, best practice doesn't come around because of good regulatory, yeah. you know, it, it comes around because of good competition, yeah. good healthy competition. And once the regulated market goes up and the quality of the product, I mean, and it goes back and forth, the black market will raise their quality and drop their prices. And, and, and so, you know, we want to make sure that price-wise, the regulated market can compete because once again, patients will turn to whatever they can afford. Yeah. And that's, that's usually the case, like shopping for groceries. Right. It just, you go to whatever store has got the best sale. Right. Yeah. Well, it's a, it's an interesting topic and I know you have to talk a lot about it. If there's, if it's going to go into the doldrums for two years, you know, the administration's going to change the whole the whole face of it, it's going to change. The landscape will be completely different in two years. Do you think this is going to be something that will survive if, if there becomes a dormant period where they still need to look at it? I, I don't think that delay will be up to two years. I mean, public health, once again, they've, they've done a good job of, of, you know, putting together what they have. There are still components that need to be worked on, especially the diagnostic com component. Um, we want to make sure, I mean, even nationally, that's a problem. Uh, coming up with standards, how to how to put together what is a standard sample of cannabis when you're testing it. Yeah. The flowers on the top are different from the flowers on the bottom, right, different right. from the flowers on the plant to the left of this. Yeah. You know, and so you know, putting together what qualifies as sample, basic 101, they still can't figure that out yet. Yeah. So um, you know, doing the best we can here um, with the best available resources out there. I mean, we just need to keep networking with yeah. those people that could keep help plugging us. at it yeah well thank you thank you you're so informative <laughs> i'm trying to be you are <laughs> thank you for joining us too have a good evening we'll see you on the radio